What's up guys and welcome to another video today. Uh, so today I want to talk about three important materials, uh, what I consider to be my workhorse materials and I pretty much use them almost in every single blend or formulation that I do, whether if it's for uh, women's or men's or unisex, anything. So what is a workhorse material? Uh, for me, a workhorse material is something that is, it's super valuable. You get so much benefit from it and pretty much every perfume formulation uh, can always benefit from this. And you'll see from a few examples of some designer fragrances that I'm gonna talk about later that use these materials. So the three materials that I wanna discuss that are a must have, or a, you really should consider using these uh, in your perfume formulation. So these workhorse materials are Isoe Super, Hedione, and Musk. So, First, we'll talk about Izoe Super, uh, why it's so important to me. So you'll pretty much go to any department store or a place that sells designer or even niche fragrances. And when you smell them, probably 90 to 95% of the time, you're smelling Izoe Super. It's used extensively in a lot of things. So if you're not already using it in your formulations or your perfume blends, I strongly urge you to start. Um, so what is Izoe Super to me? Uh, it's a workhorse material that kind of is, it's very, very faint in scent. It's, I don't wanna say it's odorless, but when you smell it, you don't really pick up anything in particular, but you do smell something. And while it is a slightly kind of dry woodiness, um, but when you put it in a perfume blend, uh, even in high concentrations, you can't immediately say, oh, I smell the Izoe Super in this. It's that faint of an odor, but you will benefit from it because pretty much any designer fragrance on the, on the counters of a department store now have tons of Izoe Super. And what it does, it's a great middle note. It's a great fixative. Uh, when you drop it out of a, a pipette, you'll notice that it's a lot more thicker uh, material so it's a slow molasses like drip it's it's not runny or watered down it's a very thick material so it's a great middle note to kind of blend all of your materials together cohesively so it just kind of unifies everything and the reason why I consider it a workhorse material is because when I'm doing a perfume formulation Izoe Super to me is kind of like that nice kind of like warm bed that all the individual scented materials kind of rest and sit in. And it just kind of, Izoe Super just kind of wraps everything around into this nice cohesive bubble of a scent. So now with Izoe Super, you're probably thinking, well, how do I use it? How much? And it could be all over the place with Izoe Super. Just to give you a few examples of some, uh, you know, modern designer fragrances. So like obviously Dior Fahrenheit, very popular. That's about 25% of its formula is Izoe Super. Um, Lancome's Tresor, which is a little bit older, uh, but that's roughly 18% Izoe Super. You've got uh, Terre de Hermes, uh, men's fragrance, 55% of that formulation is Izoe Super. Uh, then you've got like a, a popular Amber Crombie & Fitch Fierce, 48% of that formulation is Izoe Super. Lalique Ancre Noir, 45% Izoe Super. Even the famous Creed Aventus has uh, a little bit lower, but still a lot, which is roughly around 18 to 20% Izoe Super. Nautica Voyage, 24% of that formulation is Izoe Super. So you can just see just by me naming a few very popular fragrances, how much Isoe Super is actually in them and the important role that this single material plays in your perfume formulation. So if you're not already using Isoe Super, I strongly urge you to start trying it in your blends. And I just you know gave you a few percentages of uh, perfume formulations to give you an idea of how much can be used. Isoe Super, you can be in excessive amounts in Isoe Super and still do very well in your formulations. So the second workhorse material that I almost always have in my blends is Hedione. So what is Hedione? It's another middle note. And for me, it's more of a light, transparent, floral kind of scented material. They say it's leaning towards jasmine, but to me it doesn't smell like jasmine. It's missing all that jasmine sweetness and, and things like that. But it's more of a generic white floral uh, that's so generic when you smell it, you can 
almost say, yeah, I smell flowers, but you don't know what kind of flowers. You don't want to say it smells like rose. It doesn't smell like jasmine or lily of the valley or gardenia, but you do smell a generic floral scene. And it's important for me to use Hedione in my blends because in the heart or the middle of the fragrance, when you just want a little bit more kind of not necessarily oomph, but you do want just a little bit more projection and a little bit more of a nice softer cloud around your, your formulation or your fragrance is where Hedione comes into play. And it's an important role. So with Hedione, I would say uh, perfume usages with you know modern trendy perfumes today. So Hedione, let's say again, men's uh, Nautica Voyage uses roughly 6% Hedione. So when you smell Nautica Voyage, you don't really smell a floral-like scent because it's more of a, a men's aquatic vibe, but when you use a lower dosage of Hedion, like in Nautica Voyage, around 6%, it does give this exalting kind of radiance to the fragrance itself. Um, Dolce & Gabbana's Light Blue uses a much higher percentage now. We're looking at 30% of that formulation is Hedion. Uh, a famous one, um, Calvin & Klein CK1, again, 30% of that formulation is Hedione, and the famous Aqua de Gio is 25% Hedione. So you can see now the, the importance of the role in Hedione in modern trendy perfumes, where it can range from 10, 20, 30%, some can even go as high as 40%. So don't exclude this material in your formulations, and when you're using it in your formulations, don't be afraid to use it in excess. So. That's uh, my thoughts on Hedione. So the last workhorse material that I want to talk about now is musks. And when I started perfuming, I always had this notion that I did not like musks. And I smelt a lot of uh, fragrances, which I just kind of assumed, oh, it's musty or musky. And, and I didn't like it. But the more I played with different musk materials, the more I got to understand this, uh, the role of what a musk does a lot better. So with musk now, because it's different because it's not a single material, well, it is a single material, but whereas Isoe Super and Hedione is just strictly, here it is, it's that one material, that's what you're gonna get. With musks, you have options and choices of many different musks to choose from, and they all do something a little bit different. So most people, when they think of musk, they think of animalic or you know musky, uh, old school, traditional musk scents, and that's not necessarily the case. So musks can range from very soft and transparent. Sometimes they can lean a little bit more powdery. Sometimes they can lean a little bit more on the fruity side. Some can be cleaner and like a, a fresh laundered smell and some can go into the more animalic side. So with musk, you have your choices of different types of musk, whether if it's a scented musk or maybe a more lighter transparent musk. But the importance of musk for me in my perfume blends now is like, I always have some sort of musk in every perfume I do. And that's because the, the role of a musk is to solidify the base uh, of, the, uh, of the perfume fragrance. And what I mean by solidify it, because it's such a long lasting material, usually 300, 400 hours on a paper strip, all the materials that you add into your perfume blend all get blended in musk and just kind of help solidify that base and let things kind of sit longer on your skin. And the role of musk now is because it's a fixative, now you have to kind of figure out what kind of musk do I want to use, whether if it's mainly a fixative that's not necessarily scented, or if it's a fixative that imparts a kind of musky scent, whether if it's animalic, sweet, powdery, clean, etc. So when I started uh, in my early stages of perfumering, uh, perfumery, uh, I was always afraid to use too many musks because I always had the notion that it's going to smell animalic or it's going to smell too feminine or powdery and that's not the case. I was just using the wrong musks. So now I use a lot of musks because once you figure out the right musk to use in your particular perfume theme or your formulation that you're going for really gives a nice fixative and the true property of a musk in my opinion it's like a workhorse material because not only is it a fixative it makes things sit longer on the skin 
but it gives this nice, warm, pillowy kind of bed in the dry down of the fragrance. So when you're wearing a fragrance and it's about four or five hours in and you're smelling it on your skin, you do pick up this nice kind of radiantly warm, sensual kind of just aura off your skin. And that's the power of the musk and it's really important. So what are some popular fragrances nowadays that use musks? Um, again, men's. Nautica Voyage, which is a very clean aquatic scent, uses roughly about 6.5% of it is musk, and it's all galaxolide. And galaxolide is a very clean, transparent musk. You don't necessarily smell it, but you can kind of feel what it does to the overall composition, which is why they probably chose galaxolide for Nautica Voyage, because it's supposed to be a very clean, uh, transparent, aquatic watery scent so galaxolide was a proper choice for that musk and that you know themed perfume um, dolce gabbana light blue for women now is still a very clean transparent aquatic scent for women but they go a staggering 35 percent musk in that formulation and that leaning is mostly all galaxolide 35 percent galaxolide in dolce gabbana light blue for women and then some more modern, you know, popular men's fragrance like Paco Rabanne's One Million. Um, that one uses roughly about 15% in musk, but they do it differently because now they're combining different musks. Uh, so like in Paco Rabanne One Million, they're combining uh, galaxolide with tonalide, or tonalide is also called fixolide. And what that does is you get the benefits of the, of the, um, Galaxolide, which is very clean, transparent, and a great fixative, but tonalide now is a more radiant, kind of softer, almost like a clean laundered kind of musky smell. So when you combine those two together and you roughly get about 15% of the formulation is those two musks combined. So you can see the importance of musks in your fragrances. Um, so yeah. So that was my quick little video on what I consider to be the three workhorse materials that I always, always will have in my perfume blends and the reasoning why I put them in there. So uh, hopefully this kind of shed some light on you guys, uh, whether or not, if you are using this, these materials, great. Uh, I showed you uh, some you know, popular fragrances and their use percentages of these materials so you can get an idea in your head of how much should you use or how much shouldn't you use depending on what you want to do. And again, there's no right or wrong uh, when you're using these materials. Just go by your nose, let your nose be your guide and it'll tell you. So yeah, those are my three workhorse materials that I think that are very important in all perfumery kind of formulations that you should at least try if you're not trying right now. So. That's it. With that being said, until next time.